Welcome to the Nitpicking Nerds Guide to Commander Deck Building. We're offering you our rock solid insider information, undisputable best results tips to build a commander deck right now. I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, BZ, and that makes us the Nitpicking Nerds. You can check out our Discord. Because uh, it's free, and you can play Commander games in there, talk to people like us who are actually in there for reals, other fans of the channel, and if you want to support us monetarily, you can go to Patreon.com and click the support button. Yeah, there's a button that says support directly on there. And if you want daily content, make sure you subscribe to this channel, because we got daily MTG content. Oh yeah, we're keeping it going. What are we doing right now? Right now, we're going to show you, well, how we build a Commander deck and our tips for the outline, the template, if you will. Yeah, the skeleton, all the big points of contention when building a deck, we're talking about them. First, before you build your deck, hold on. There's three things you gotta consider. What are they? They're pretty simple. You need to know your commander. Um, these aren't, these are, there's three of them, but they're not necessarily in any order. You can determine these in whatever order you want, but you need to figure out these three things. So, first we have, find your commander. You just, you need to know who that is. It's a central part of your deck. Almost every commander deck is built around it in at least some way. You're casting your commander every single game. Your commander is impacting the game every single time it's cast. And you have a card that you always have access to. So you should build around it as every deck basically does. And you're going to need to figure out what that is before you start figuring out the numbers of cards you want to play. Yeah, you know, we don't want to determine the number of lands before we know the commander, because guess what? It will be impacted most likely by the commander. Yeah, your commander impacts everything else. It's a ripple effect. Next, find your game plan. Figure out what your deck actually wants to do. I usually call it like the elevator pitch. Like, my deck is going to do this with this and win with this. Just figure out how, if the game goes well for you, well, what does that actually mean? What are you doing? Uh, I think, and once you have the game plan, I think one thing you can do with this Game plans uh, can only fit into certain archetypes. So now you can start looking for your archetypes. Like, if you want to go wide, make lots of creatures, and attack, okay, well, you're looking to play probably tokens then. Now now you've, you've reached into an archetype, and now that archetype will help you determine what cards you want to look for. Yeah, and the game plan can be literally anything. You can go, I want to play this goofy car as my secret commander. Well, now your game plan is or find this goofy card and win with it. And then So the archetype is just kind of like, it kind of falls into whatever supports that but there usually are things to do it if you're trying to clone a creature maybe you can make you kind of fall into tokens where you're populating and cloning and stuff like that exactly the, though they are similar game plan and archetype they are different and you do want to figure out both of them before you take the next steps which is actually looking at cards to put in your deck yeah for example your your deck archetype is aristocrats but your game plan is flood the board with creatures and then sacrifice them and take advantage of drain effects to win the game. Exactly. Um, so now we're going to get into numbers. These are just, these are the very simple ones. You've seen, you've seen, if anyone's done one of these videos before, um, you've seen the numbers. People give direct numbers. So we're going to give our numbers. These, again, aren't perfect. It's and a guide. To mention right now, there's always going to be outliers. Uh, the first one we do is lands here. There's, I already can tell you right now, I have a deck with more lands than we suggest because I have a lands deck and that's an outlier from this. Yes. The Nitpicking Nerds official TM land recommendation, 30 to 36. 30 is trending more towards your competitive CEDH or just really low curve decks. 36 trending more towards lands matter, especially when you consider the other part of lands, which is MDFC lands. And those we recommend zero to eight. And you can adjust your land count based on how many MDFCs you have. Absolutely. I think the the if you put two MDFCs in, you can guarantee 100% without feeling bad at all, take out a land. Uh, we go one for one usually. I'll just take out a Plains and put in a Kabir's takedown every time. Yeah, we don't really have an issue with that. Obviously, your deck, the competitive level only accounts for so many MDFCs or certain types. Maybe you only want the mythic ones. Either way, you're at zero to really like eight maximum MDFCs. And 30 to 36, I'm usually right around... 32, 33, and then three or four MDFCs. Yep, I, I, exactly the same for me. Another thing about the MDFCs, just to mention very quickly, your four, five color decks aren't going to play almost any, where in uh, three colors will play some, and two colors will play as, all of them, <laughs> as many as they can, and one color will play as many as they can. Yeah, two colors is where you get the most. You end up with like six, seven, if you really mm -hmm. want to play a bunch of them. Uh, how about card draw? Card draw. Well, we go from six card draw spells up to around 12 card draw spells on the high end. 
six? That's not 10. Yeah, so 10 is a number that um, we've seen other places. And 10 is a good middle point. If we want to give like a one, if we had to give like a singular number, sure, I might just say 10. But I don't, I'm not a big fan of giving a singular number because no deck is the same. Um, I don't want to just aim for 10 every time I build a deck, and I don't. Yeah, I think it's a mistake half the time to just say, you're playing commander? Well, you better play 10 card draw spells. Like That's just really confusing. I'd just so much rather offer you a range of 6 to 12. Now, the 6, when we're trending towards uh, 6, your commander has card draw on it. Your deck takes advantage of some other spells to gain advantage. You have big, tutorable ways of card advantage where you don't need a ton of them. And then trending towards 12 is, well, maybe you're a control deck. You're trying to clear the board. You don't want to have any threat go unanswered because your deck is slow. Yeah, exactly. You want to make sure um, card advantage, when you're tending towards 12, card advantage is going to be one of your main ways to win the game. Um, you're going to be doing that to like get to the point where you're going to win. You're going to have so many resources more than your opponents in your hand that that is your win con. Exactly. Included within these card draw spells also is card advantage. So like a Bolas the Citadel, though technically not going to draw you cards, is going to provide you access to way more cards than you would have access to otherwise. So count that towards your card draw because it is it ostensibly just is. Yeah, we're talking about like find access to new cards. So not like I would count, let's say, removal as something different. It's card advantage, but it's not card draw. So take all of that into consideration, all of your card draw, card advantage engines, same thing basically. So there you go. And we're now we're talking about removal. Single slash multi-target removal. Ways to kill one or more things, but not all things, because that's its own category. We're saying 7 to 15. Again, I wouldn't just say you need 10 minimum. Uh, it really depends on what deck you are. If you are trending towards 7, you're probably a more competitive, aggressive, faster, combo-licious deck that just doesn't need all of this fancy schmancy. Just like they don't need a ton of card draw, because they just have tutors and they need two cards and they win. This is... Well, we don't really need that much removal. We're just going to use pinpoint stuff to take out what actually stops us from aggressively winning. Exactly. Uh, another thing about this is these numbers are very, they're so much different here. Um, seven is like going to be your decks that, again, don't need to interact as much. And 15, you're the one, you need to interact. You That's, you're the control type deck. Yeah, also, you're, you're the policeman. Yeah. Also within these, uh, these single targeted and multiple removal, we're counting counter spells. Um, they're not they're not exactly a removal, but they're interaction. They so, trade. They yeah. trade cards for their cards. Yeah, exactly. So we're counting the counter spells. We're counting the uh, swords, the plowshares, the beast withins, uh, even the um, like. What's the one that gets rid of one for each of them? Oh, like crackling doom. Crackling doom. That's a good example. Yeah, I couldn't think. A shatter. A shatter. Soul shatter. Soul shatter. That was the one with the that art's great. Wiley Beckett did a great job on that art. Yeah, this is relevant. It to is. Deck it is that relevant. Just consider how good Wiley Beckett is. When building your deck, I, I'll tell you one thing I consider that you, that is not for power. I do put in cool art sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we do that. Our decks kind of had somewhere between eleven and twelve, so we fell right in the the maybe the closer to the fifteen. Uh, yeah, BZ actually had a deck with twenty two in it. I had a deck with yeah, it was sixteen single or multi target, twenty two like removal total. Oh yeah. And then if we look at my CDH uh, Carador CDH deck. It has way closer to seven. It's probably 10 or less because it doesn't care that you have a 6-6 six, six creature. I'm just going to ignore it and win. Yeah, it only needs to interact with very specific pieces. Yeah, oh, rest in peace. Well, let's get rid of that. Um, another, next, we have board wipes. There, you want two to six of these. Again, control decks want the six. Two is, I'm a creature deck. I don't want to wipe the board, so I'm not going to play very many board wipes. And if you want to get CDH, -E, yeah, maybe you just want zero. Yeah, CDH decks can just straight up play zero. I just care less about that stuff. Yeah, um, if you're a green deck that doesn't want to wipe creatures away, something you get to play things like Bane of Progress. Still counts the board wipe. Yeah, uh, it's a different kind of board wipe. We count those two um, because if you're wiping all of any t of a uh, one or more types, that's what we consider a board wipe. Maybe not the perfect definition, but it's what we use. Yeah, I think people on average tend to play too many board wipes. Yeah. Six we have at the top because of like really grindy control decks that want to just slow the game down and try to win with whatever their win condition is. We play like two to three. I have a control deck. I think it has five. Yes. Um, 
I don't know how many I have. You don't yeah. need a ton of board wipes. You really don't. It's 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 between two and four for all basically all of my decks. I don't really go over that. I don't have I don't have any control decks. I'm not saying like obviously the six is completely reasonable in the right decks. But, but don't like, just jam six in your deck before you, you know, before you ex- assess what you are. Exactly. Yeah. Two to four. Just it's probably the better range. The five and six is like your. You're a control deck. You need to wipe the board. It's important. Or there are like, lots of decks that do need that. Or it's like some weird meta call. Yeah, exactly. Next, we have ramp. 10 to 16 ramp spells. Um, this is, a again, a big range. We wanted to keep these range. I want to point out this just one more time. The range of these is so important. Um, because if I, I if we zero in in the middle at 13, I don't think that's helpful. You, you couldn't be at 10 and have a great deck. You can be at 16 and have a great deck. You could even be a little higher, a little lower. Yeah, you could be at 15, see that somebody wants you to play 13, and then go, oh, I have to cut two ramp spells. And then your deck gets worse. Yeah, because you're a deck that takes advantage of those ramp spells in any way. If lands into the battlefield helps you, the ramp spells just become like draw spells like in an AC deck. Yeah, there is literally no metric to determine how many ramp spells is correct for your exact configuration of 100 singleton cards. Like, that does not exist. There is anyone telling you that is just lying to you. You need to find the range. You can play test every once in a while. Maybe add one or two, cut one or two if you really want to find like what's right for you. But you got to play a ton of games. We're talking like to get these numbers, you have to play like hundreds of thousands of games. Yes, which you're never going to do ever. But we can give you this rough guide on what has worked for us in the past and what. Well, and again, this isn't just based on like what we do too. We I n- looked at other people's decks, yeah. talked to other people. We understand where other people are going to. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons we also like to do the range because some of the ranges are going to be like, would be a lot less if it's just us. It's like, like I said, borders would be two to three for us. That's that's ours. It's not just us. It's the format. This exactly. is like, I can say this works for me, but now I can tell you send to 16 will work for you. I can just say that. Yes. It, yeah. I think if you can aim for in there again, like I said, some will play more, some will play less than that. But if you aim for that, you'll be fine. Yeah, you'll be totally be able, able to compete with all these numbers. And then the last one we have is win conditions. How many primary ways to win do you have? You know, direct lines where you can say A plus B equals win, or, you know, your Crater of Behemoths fall under, your Expropriates. There's one card win conditions, and then there's like Critical Mass where you're comboing and assembling two to three card combos. Now, if your deck has a bunch of different cards that can be combo pieces, you're technically going to have like 45 ways to win. But we're talking like, okay, Phyrexian Altar combo, that's one. Yeah. Uh, Protean Hulk combo, that's two. Yeah. I think, and also one thing here, these aren't, the win condition thing isn't the number for cards exactly. Like all the other ones are the number of cards you want. This win condition thing is two to three ways to make sure you can win the game. So if you have top Reservoir Citadel, that combo, that's one. That's one um, win condition. Every deck needs more than one win condition. If you're like, I'm just going to attack them, I would say you have a vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. Um, So let's just take uh, Stomp. I play a Stompy deck where the main win condition is to attack. But there's things like Chandra's Ignition where I can just potentially have a 21-21, kill everyone's board, and then attack, and who's going to live through that? Right, right, right. That's one for combat, and then one for I have these big damage-based spells yep. that maybe if you were just saying, well, combat's enough, you wouldn't even play those cards, and that's just, you're missing out. You're missing out on a win percentage. Yes, exactly. I, and if you just want to attack with combat, there is there are win conditions within combat. Like, I would describe Xenagos as a win condition within combat. Um, he gives you so much more power. You can describe Kratohoof as a as a win condition within just combat. So you can just go a combat route if you want. Just make sure there's other ways than just putting my creatures out. If the Putting creatures out that are just vanilla guys and attacking will never get you there. Yeah, attacking with Grave Titan, if that's your, that's it, that's all you got, you're just never going to win as many games as you could if you double up or triple up on your win conditions. I also would say don't try to play more than three, you know, ish. Don't try to play more than three ish. If you've got like seven different ways to win, it's just overkill. You're going to have cards that don't do anything in your hand because their primary goal is to win. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to be caught with a bunch of like high CMC spells. Um, yeah, we're going to get into that. We have a whole CMC thing coming up. Yeah, but let's just say if you have Avengers, Zendikar, Crater of Behemoth, and Expropriate in your hand, well, you need one of those to win, presumably. You don't need all three, so two cards, you just mulligan twice if you have stuff like that, and it's going to gum up your openers and just make it tough. Now that we know the general numbers that we want to fill, we have to actually look at what cards we're going to play specifically, and that brings up something really important, 
Mana curve. Mana curve is so, so important. The first three to five turns of a game are going to determine probably most games. They set the pace of the whole thing. It's not like, oh, whoever's ahead on turn five wins, but it's whoever's ahead on turn five is poised to win. Yeah, exactly. I think this is uh, a great way to show how important those turns are is how much a soul ring makes a difference in a game. If you play it on turn one, it basically puts you on turn three. Now you're so, f and you're going to, for the next three turns, you're going to be playing cards that no one else has access to because you're so far ahead. Those early turns are way too important to just take them off and do nothing. Yeah, I think you'll find our mana curves to be very interesting. We averaged a total of 10 Nipicking Nerds personal decks that we actually play. And we'll get to the numbers in just a second, but we, we prioritize a little bit lowering of the curve. I find that over, you know, the seven or eight or nine, 10, whatever years I've been playing Commander, I've just gradually been lowering my curve and lowering it, not necessarily even lowering the power level or high, increasing the power level of my deck, but just lowering the mana curve, making my spells easier to play so I play more spells per game, get more stuff done, have more efficiency when I do things, and I feel like it definitely increased my win percentage like a ton. Yes, it, it helps so much when you, again, when you can double and triple spell and your spells are still just as powerful because, you know, you built your deck correctly with the synergies you wanted, it's going to feel really good. Yeah, but I'm casting Nature's Claim instead of Cross and Grip, and then I'm casting another spell instead of spell B. I'm just saving all this mana and winning the game with efficiency. So just going to run through these numbers real quick, and then we'll talk about them after. But zero drops. Uh, on average, we have 1.9. So basically two cards that cost zero in uh, in one of our decks. And these don't have to be like Chrome Mox or... Jewel Lotus. We're talking stuff like Mishra's Bauble, too, or Hang Your Back Walker. Uh, one drops. What about that one, Cherries? Uh, we have 12.9, which is basically about 13 one drops per deck. Get those one drops in your deck. They're so important. If you can do something on turn one, when all the other players play tap land, it feels real good. Especially if it's a Mana Dork. I mean, a lot of, a lot of these uh, green decks have contributed the one drops. That's Mana Dorks. Yeah, Mana Dorks. Absolutely amazing. Uh, at two, we have about 16 two drops. On turn two, basically with this, with these numbers that we have, we have 16 two drops, 13, so we're up to 29, and at zero, we have two. So up to 31. We're almost guaranteed to do something by turn two at the latest in these decks. I refuse to pass turn two having done nothing. I feel bad. I feel behind in a I, lot of games if you I, pass turn two without playing a signet or a creature or anything. See, I don't feel bad doing it. It happens. It does happen. It definitely does. But you want to build to, for it to happen as little as possible. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen sometimes still. It doesn't matter how many you do. Yeah, you could have 98, and then you're going to draw the hand with six lands and the seven drop you have. Exactly. You know? that can happen, and that's, gonna, that's going to happen, but you want to lower that. You want it to happen as little as possible. Yes. Uh, three drops, right about 16.7, so 17 three drops. I think this is the – three drops are the danger zone when you build commander decks. Uh, based on how we build, which we'll get into after this, you're going to end up with like 45 three drops. You have to cut it so that it's not, you just can't play 25 three drops in your deck. It's it's just a weird spot where you just stop being able to double spell as quickly. And a lot of them can be cut for one or two drops in some cases. So be careful on your three drops. It'll get real crowded. It is. Yeah. I mean, there's just the reason that I think we peak at two, three here. Um, your two or your three is going to be your highest spot usually in your deck. It, well, in our deck. Should be. I think we think that it probably should be for an efficient deck overall. But like three drops, there's so many, there's just so many good three drops, I think. I think this is why we talk against like cards like Cultivate. Um, they fit into this three drop slot. They are, Cultivate, I, like I want to explain that this is a good card. Cultivate does good things. It's a solid card. But I feel like it clogs up that three slot when you can be playing things that have more synergy when you deck. Yeah, if you're a creature deck, Cultivate gets edged out by every single mana dork that's ever existed. All that, like, the Wood Elf variants, which are more efficient and put a creature in play when you care about it. But uh, three drops, yes, we have about 17. Four drops, we have 9.5, so less than 10 uh, by slightly. Less than 10, four drops in our deck. This is where I feel like cards start to get a little clunky not necessarily right at four but everything above four for me is like ooh, i do not play those cards very often so i think not, it, and we're not cdh yeah we're talking about those um 
Well, we play a lot of them. We do. We play almost 10 four drops. Right. Um, it's not like we're not playing these cards. This is the point on your curve where double spying becomes very, very hard. Because to cast a four drop... Oh, two four drops? Two four mean? drops? It just doesn't happen. So you don't want to be clogged up at this point. You, But you can go four drop into one or two drop. That is po- that is totally reasonable. And that's why having the well, higher amount of the lower ones is so important. But these spells are going to be very powerful usually, and they're going to be potent. So make sure you're using the right ones for your deck. Yes. Uh, five drops. This is going to be so much lower than so many people think it is. It's 4.4. Basically, we got four five drops in our deck. And I... It's not that I want to cut five drops or I want to play only one drops in my deck. I compare all these cards and I'm like, what's the best cut? Well, it's between this five drop removal spell. Maybe I can cut this two drop removal spell. Well, guess which one's getting cut? It's always the card that's five when I'm comparing it. If that's a tiebreaker, it's just such an easy thing to go. I get to play more magic with this card, not in my deck. It's going to increase my rent percentage. Yeah, exactly. The curve, we're just, we, you. The, it's literally a curve. You, you go up, you peak, and as you go to the end, you just get lower and lower. And but where, that's but where do you point. peak? You don't peak at five. I think you're in trouble if you're peaking at five. Yeah, if you're peaking at five, you're going to be in trouble. You want your average CMC much lower than that. Mm-hmm. I I would caution against peaking at four, too, honestly. Actually, it's not CMC anymore. It's mana value. Yeah, it's mana value. I actually wrote that on the script. I see that. Yeah, I actually, yeah. Wow. What Look, a at profe- me. Look at me go. What a professional. At six drops, we're at about 3.2, so that's three on average. We don't want to go much over that. Six drops, again, clunky, powerful spells, but you're only ever going to be able to play one of them a turn, like we said. Six, and se- uh, six drops and higher are where you start to draw opening hands that are non-functional if you have too many of these in your deck. And that's what I'm trying to avoid with at least cutting six drops. We go way low on six drops. Sometimes it's zero, one, two, or three, and I don't really play more than five ever. Just that's my personal preference from what I've noticed, and I've had very good results with the changes I've made. S- six drops just has to be really good, and some of them are like Bolas of Citadel. It's like, well, I'm just going to win the game. <laughs> this card's insane, or completely insane, if you will. But then some of them are like... Like Grave Titan is just the perfect example. Do I need this? No. Can something else do this exact effect for cheaper? Lots of things, yes. I think something about these high drops is this is all, Curve is all about knowing what your deck wants to do. Yep. I have decks with like 20 cards over 5 CMC. It's like, I have a deck like that. Of course, I have a ton of early game to like ramp into that. Mm -hmm. But I... My deck wants to be big stompy. It wants to be big and stupid. It okay. knows what it wants to be. It's averaged in here. It's part of the, the 10 decks we averaged. Exactly. And it's like we still end up at three. Yeah. It's just it's all about, again, you want those three questions you asked beforehand are just so important. When you understand your deck, you can really make better choices for deck building. Yeah. If you're an aristocrat's deck, I get this example a lot, so I'm just going to throw it out there because it applies perfectly. If you're an aristocrat's deck and you're like, well, one of my win conditions is comboing Nim Death Mantle and Ashnod's Altar to make infinite mana with creatures that produce multiple other creatures on ETB. Yeah, you can play Grave Titan. Uh Uh-huh. It's six mana. So then, let's say I'm looking at this deck that's mine, and I have Grave Titan and these two things. Well, I go, is there anything cheaper that makes two bodies and has an ETB? Oh, yeah, there's like five other creatures that do that. So cut I cut Grave Titan. We'll throw in Weapon Craft Enthusiast. I'm not winning with a 6-6 vanilla anyway, so it doesn't matter that this thing is a 1-1 that makes 0-0s. Zero it just, oh, 0-1s. Uh, it's going to enter, do its thing, provides bodies to sacrifice if I'm not comboing, and then just the same as Grave Titan, wins me the game and gets infinite mana. Exactly. Um, and the last thing, 7 plus drops, we play 1.9 or 2. These are absolutely, like, super strong spells, obviously. you, you got to really talk me into this. And we are not including for 7 plus... Uh, I feel like no website has gotten this right yet, but Treasure Cruise is not an 8-mana spell. Dig Through Time is not an 8-mana spell. Blasphemous Act does not cost 9. Uh, this, is, this isn't going to matter, but Emrakul of Promise End does not cost 13. Mm-hmm. So a lot of those, plus the 7-mana MDFCs, they're not 7-mana spells. That's yeah. what's so good about them. The they're Bant, lands. Yeah, the Bant ones, those are all 7-mana. They're not 7-mana spells. They're not really seven mana spells. So you can, when you're doing your deck and you're trying to fit like our numbers sort of, um, don't aim for exact numbers. Don't aim for exact numbers. These are averages. Um, Aim for what the card will actually cost you in the game. Treasure Cruise is going to cost you like three. So, you know, throw it in a two or a three slot uh, or even a one if you're super heavy on that. And throw the MDF season for free. Don't worry about that. 
but actual cards that will always cost seven or more, we're on like two. Yes. All right, so next we're heading into general tips. These are just general overall deck building tips. And I want to start with one thing. Um, again, I'm, I'm, why am I avoiding saying the command zone? did a template video and they talked about I was avoiding saying it but I'm like why am I they'll uh, come after us they'll, they're gonna come for us um, they did one and they talked about like number of enablers payoffs and stuff like that I don't I don't think we can even give numbers for those because I think literally every single deck is different um, I think an aristocrat deck needs a different number of enablers than a tokens deck than a uh, a land stack control than deck a might have none control deck than a planeswalker deck the no I don't even think there is numbers to give for those, honestly. I think it is so case-to-case -case basis that giving you general numbers will not be helpful. No, these are broad tips that if you haven't you know, heard them before, you internalize them, they're really going to help you when you're doing the other two things, big things, when you say, how many of each card do I want? What does my actual 99 look like? How do I want to organize my mana curve to determine how I'm making the final cuts for this deck? So what's the first one? The first thing is get as many cards as you think might make the deck together in either a deck list online. So this is how we do it. We go to Moxfield and we type up our whole deck. There's uh, probably usually somewhere between 110 to 150 cards. And that, that's not counting lands. That's not counting lands. And we just throw everything. We're like, does this have a chance at being in this deck? Of course it does. So we throw it in and we just get as many as we can. And then we start cutting from there. Uh, another one, if you're more of a builder with your cards, throw all your cards in a pile yes. that could be in this deck. Be like, okay, this is all the cards I can play with and then start cutting as you go. Lay out the curve. Yeah, you want a real quick way to start cutting cards? Lay out your curve and you will make a lot of cuts that would have taken longer if you're just flipping through the cards in your hand, uh, not knowing what, what cost everything is. Oh, I have, there's 12 cards that cost seven or more. Well, if I'm gonna use an Ipiki Nerds deck building guide, TM, I'm <laughs> going to cut like nine of them right away. I don't need all of these. And now suddenly I go from 150 to 141 and it's just gonna be easier from there. Yeah, exactly. That perfect, perfectly, perfectly said. And if you use the websites, they literally are built in. They, with yeah, all they these sort things. it for you. Um, again, let's just ever Moxfield, great for building decks. Yeah, we used to use Tapped Out. Nothing against Tapped Out. I just think Moxfield works a little bit better, and it's so much flashier. It's, it's so much easier to use. Yes, it is very good, and they have a great community. Next thing that we got here is building towards your theme. Oh my God, we've. We've, I've, we've said it probably five times this video already. Yeah, but and we've also said it every time we tune up one of your decks, every time we do a precon power up, <sighs> it's just like one of the core things you need to understand uh, if you don't already. I think this is like, this is a core thing to fun in EDH actually, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think we bring it up so much. And I, I never, I actually just thought of this right now. When you build towards your themes and you actually go for the themes rather than just throwing in your staples, you're really gonna have a more fun, more interesting deck. Whereas if you just throw in all these staples, not that you won't have fun and not that you won't enjoy it, but it's not going to be as unique. It's, it's not, not going to feel like you're yeah. doing the thing. And I generally, building towards your theme is going to give you a higher win percentage. Your deck's going to do the thing it wants, more hardcore, more streamlined, and you're going to save multiple turns versus if you had played random you know, staples that don't do anything for your, your strategy. Exactly. Put... Put in extra life gain cards, put in extra uh, landfall cards, put in extra whatever your deck is doing. Big stompy creatures. Like, again, I, I, I like the stompy thing again. I ignore basically our own rules because I know the deck is something else. I understand it. it's like, this is a big stompy deck. It wants stupid six drops all the time. Yes, it's going to be able to mitigate the fact that they cost a thousand by ramping extra. There's more ramp. There's more ways to do this. Um, and I'm not saying don't play Ristic Study. We're talking about like, you can still play all your core, like top 10 of staples. Course. We're talking about, this is the best example in the world. So I'm gonna keep using it. Like cultivate. If you're a creature deck or a graveyard deck or any deck that cares about any card type that is not a sorcery, get cultivate out of your friggin' deck and play card like Wood Elves. I understand that Wood Elves gets one forest and Cultivate gets two for us. I am aware of that uh, difference. Wood Elves is a creature in your deck that cares about creatures. How many creature cards are in my graveyard? Well, three, but I could have four if this Cultivate was a Wood Elves. How many creatures do I want to sacrifice this turn? Well, I don't have as many as I want because I cast Cultivate and not a Wood Elves. There's gonna be 85 little corner case scenarios that while you can say, 
Cultivate gets two lands, but Wood Elves gets one. I can type up a 10,000 word document of what Wood Elves does for your creature deck or your elf deck or whatever else that Cultivate can't ever do because it only has one effect. That's it. Exactly. That is very very well put again. Yeah, that was a good good little rant there. Uh, next, I also want to say for the th staying on theme, so this is just a random thing. I could play, I'm playing a life gain deck. My goal is to gain life. Uh -huh. I could play, that's just two cards here, uh, Phyrexian Arena, which is a fine draw spell. It's okay. Um, or I could play Cosmos Elixir. Phyrexian is better. I mean, it is better. I mean, it's not that it's not this great card. Cosmos Elixir is not a great card either. But it's cool because it's on my life theme. I love going to it. I love playing themed cards. Just for the record, I think it's close, and I have decided which one's better. Oh, okay. Well, interesting. I actually didn't think about that. I thought, it, but that's interesting. I I just like playing the card that is um, the th way more the theme. Yeah, that one is more of um, well, I guess Cosmos Elixir is just better than Phyrexian Arena in like a life gain deck where your deck's just going to be at 50 life. Okay. Uh, so there's a bl plenty of spots like that where you can go, these cards are very similar, but this one wants me to do the thing. And when I'm doing the thing, it's better. Yeah. Well, if you're if you're not doing the thing, you're aiming to do the thing. And if you're doing the thing, congratulations, your card's better than a random staple. Yeah, that it's also, I don't think is very good anyway. Yeah, it, it does, it does uh, draw in stuff. But that is an upside it has on Arena. You get that the first turn you put it out if you have 40 or more life. Well, it replaces itself. Yeah. Frexy Arena doesn't replace itself until your next turn. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually do like the card. It's very cool. Um, What's next? What well, are we doing next? we got to understand the strengths of the archetype. What is your deck? What is your archetype? Well, we already know that because we figured it out before we even built this thing. So we got an Aristocrats deck. Well, what are the strengths? Flooding the board with creatures, being resilient to board wipes, etc. As long as you understand that, you can play the cards of the choice, like the removal spell that best suits your style. Yeah, these are where the, this is where the number things come in. And they this will help you adjust. Like We have those big ranges because when you go, okay, I'm building the... We'll just do the control deck again. The weaknesses of my deck are I don't put creatures on the board. I can't interact in, or I can't stop creatures from getting on the board at all the time. There's going, and if they want to attack me, they can just knock me out of the game. So understanding that, you go, okay, I need more board wipes because that's one of my weaknesses. I need more spot removal to keep things off of my back. Yeah, you get to play tricky stuff like, oh, I'll play thematic compass. So now they're deterred. Their best creature can't attack me. So maybe they just won't attack me with anything. And that happens all the time. Uh, Understand the strengths and the weaknesses. For example, my strength is I have a bunch of creatures. Well, that means Fleshbag Marauder is a net positive for me. Just a lot of little realizations like that, they're going to get your win percentage way up. Yeah, exactly. You should. You need to realize one card. Because um, Fleshbag Marauder or what's the good one? Playcrafter? Yeah. Playcrafter is the really good one. Um, you have to understand, that's not just a, that's not any deck card. It's mm -hmm. just not. Um, if, it's, if you're going to play it and then sack it, and that's the play, that's not good. But if you're going to play it, sack a token, leave it on the battlefield, and potentially do anything else with it, that's so much better. And understanding that you're an aristocrat stack. Your token that just died might have drawn you a card. Yeah, or, I mean, play grafter if you sack it and you draw two cards off of it. Well, now I'm in. Exactly. Now, now we're talking. And this works for every archetype. We're, we're using examples. Basic examples, too. There's plenty of more complex examples. Yeah, exactly. So you just need to understand this. Whatever your archetype is, you need to look into it. And... It's, I love I love this about this. Like I play, uh, uh, we'll go to Stompy really quick here for another one more example of its strengths in the archetype. I understand that I'm going to have the biggest baddest creatures on the field. So board wipes, I'm at like two, two yeah. board wipes in the whole deck because I don't need to wipe the board. My stuff is ridiculously big. Yeah, if in <laughs> terms of rumbling and like actually attacking and blocking, uh, it's just not a big issue for you. I have uh, the God Eternal Catcher deck. I have. I'm gonna pump out like six four fours that have vigilance, so they're attacking. <laughs> And they're not really worried about blocking because they have vigilance and their four fours is pretty big. I I don't know if I play any board wipes in that deck. I think I play one. Exactly. You don't have to play a lot of board wipes if you're the rumbling deck. You just and that's all about understanding what you you have to you have to really understand what your deck is, what it wants to do. And this this goes back all this is all the pre deck building things again. It's so important to have an understanding of what your deck wants to do. Yeah. And the last thing that we're just going to stress real quick again. Now, when you have card draw, removal, and ramp, and you got to fill it in, well, guess what my top priorities are besides the best of the best staples like Swords to Plowshares or whatever? Top priorities are cards that now synergize with my deck. For example, if um, the Fleshbag Marauder thing, we'll just go back to that. That's better than Terminate yeah. because Terminate doesn't do anything for your deck if you're an Aristocrats deck. It has literally no text. That's it. Destroy a creature. Yeah, two mana ain't bad, but 
I'll take any creature that does any removal instead. Yeah, I, exactly. I think the best examples are the ones we put in the video. If we're gonna, we're, if you want a creature, uh, you want removal, Shriek Maw, Chupacabra, sure, more expensive uh, on one end, the other one doesn't hit non, hits non-black knife. It's a trade-off. The card is more expensive, but it's better in your deck and has that 10,000 word page document of corner cases and regular cases where it's just better. I think, I think what is undervalued um, here and what is missed? Um, this is this is all of actually this is this is a little thing about our terminate video. It's this is this literal little thing we're talking about is where our terminate video comes from. I think that little these synergies that will add up over a game, and that you can get everywhere and every little card you put in, is why we don't want to play terminate. Just pretty much terminate's ever. efficiency is very good. It doesn't really synergize. The place I, the you know where I'll play it? I'll play it in my cast deck where it actually makes sense. Then that's where you start to make sense, actually. Oh, it's like, I can cast it twice, but I can't oh, cast Ravenous Trooper Cover twice. Exactly. But everywhere else, you know, first of all, if you're in like a three color mid range deck that just needs removal spells, well, Terminate may be efficient, but guess what? Its versatility is like a big fat goose egg. It doesn't do anything except destroy a creature. Well, we're talking about now stuff like Chaos Warp or Deadly Rock. It's like, okay, I'll exile it for free, or I'll target any permanent in play. And we do plenty of stuff like that. Yeah. And a last note, we understand budget is a thing, but some videos aren't about budget in <laughs> Terminate, that Terminate video. But yeah, well, again, right to this here, do put the card draw in that fits with your deck. Again, Cosmos Elixir fits with my deck. I'm always over 50 life in that deck. Liza attacks once, I'm at 45. Right. <laughs> so pretty simple, easy things like that. Um, Removal, like we said, creatures in ramp. We literally had an example of what else? So perfect examples for all three of those. But do you have any more general tips before I end this video? No, I do hope this video was of help to you. I think we got a lot of big key things, some things we haven't even said before, out into the open. They're here to help you build a deck, increase your win percentage, have more fun even, just increase your fun percentage. And I'll just say the one thing again, because I think this is, I, because uh, it's the end of the video, it's the last time I'm going to say it. I know I've said it like four times. Understanding your deck is the most important step to building a deck. Understanding everything your deck wants to do is so important because you can just, if you don't know what you want to build, all you're going to end up with is a pile of staples. Yep. And like the deck's going to be fine. It's going to be strong and you can do that. There's not even anything necessarily wrong with that, but you can build a much more efficient, better and synergistic deck if you take the time to understand what you want to do. All right. I think we got to end it. Absolutely. So special shout outs to every single one of our patrons. We love you all as much as we can without making you uncomfortable. Obviously, we would never want to make anyone uncomfortable. Never, never. But you can also go, if you don't want to support us on Patreon, you don't have to. Go to the TCG Player link. Now when you buy cards through TCG Player, just navigate, buy the cards like you normally would, but start with our link. We get a kickback on the order. You didn't spend any extra money. And as a side bonus, you're supporting local game stores. Yes. You're support yeah, exactly. You're supporting local game stores. And you support us without spending an extra cent. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's like a way your way of tipping us the next time you go to buy cards. It's a free roll. Doesn't look like a free roll until you roll the dice. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, shake them like that. There we go. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> okay, do you have a tidbit? A tidbit? Oh, yeah. No, it's actually something I wanted to mention because oh, okay. um, we our ultimate goal is for overall for a career is just to do this. Um, there isn't something greater than this. This isn't like, this isn't a stepping stone to doing something that that we, else. Yeah, if you ask me where I see myself in 10, 15, 20 years, uh, hopefully making the Magic the Gathering content on whatever social media is, preferably YouTube, but whatever social media I can spread the message to the most people, that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna make Magic the Gathering commander content. Exactly. That, and that's our goal. Yeah, so we were thinking about it, and we know that this is what we want to do. You, want, you ready for something, BZ? This okay. is pretty... This is... this is Well, it's something I haven't said to you, and I think it's... If we... Are you coming out? I'm already gay. Oh, okay. I've been out of the closet since I was 16. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been literally 14 years for me. Half of my life. Uh, regardless. If... Well, not if. Not if. When we reach... This is so many subscribers. 250,000 subscribers... I am going to officially change my name to Joe Cherries. <laughs> when do we reach that goal? You're going to literally... <laughs> I'm going to literally change my name. I know you. I, I didn't tell you because I wanted to... legally change your... I know you talked about it. I, I remember going, oh, man, because it sounded like you were actually interested in it. I'm like, <laughs> you actually liked it. And I'm like, oh, dang, he's being, he's being kind of serious. Yeah, but it's... So it's fun. Who cares about it's last names? It's literally, my person, it's literally my persona. It's who I'm known as. It's what everyone knows. Our friend, who I've been playing Magic with, 
for well over a year, maybe two years. I don't know the time frame actually. Literally went and said, your last name isn't Cherries? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was like, no, no, it's not. It's that not was, actually Cherries. That was the spark that changed all this. Cherries right. like, now I got to make it so that my last name is Cherries. So now when someone asks, why is your name Joe Cherries? That's my legal name, dummy. That's my legal name. Of course I, my mom named me Joe Cherries. But I thought it was a cool little thing to like set a huge goal. Like That's I don't, pretty cool. I, we're getting, I'm going to put that as many places as I can because... I think a lot of people would like to see you. Maybe we'll vlog it. <laughs> yeah, as soon as as soon as it um, it's it's far away. I mean, it's quarter more than, mil. It's more than ten times our sub Qu- count quarter rate. mil. Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying this is going to be soon, but as soon if it happens, which no, when it happens, it's not. There's no if. I we don't know, do ifs here. We're going to keep going. We're not going to stop this. Some something would have to go off the rails completely for us to want to even come close to stopping this. No, I'll have to die. Uh, and when it happens. I'm going to legally do it. And I'll, I'll, don't worry. I'll show the court papers. I'll do yeah. all that stuff. We'll make sure we get it done right. I was actually, I Googled it to make sure it was doable and possible before this. Why wouldn't it be? Because uh, some places it's like a pain. Like oh. you have to jump through 25 hoops to do it. Um, but it's not that bad in New York State, actually. Well, there, you have that to look forward to. There's 250,000 sub goal, which is now the highest goal before I think we had 100,000 subs. We're going to get a life size. Uh, uh, Anakin action figure, because <laughs> so, those ones are too tiny. Oh uh, no, Obi Wan. We're getting Obi-Wan. oh Obi Wan. Yeah, we're, get, we're getting life size Obi Wan at a hundred thousand. Yeah, uh, not life size, but like it's like this tall, expensive figurine size. Yeah, like two thousand dollar Obi Wan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's our hundred thousand. And at two hundred fifty thousand, look forward to actual factual Joe Cherries. I wonder what. That's a weird scale of change. A <laughs> hundred thousand will buy an action figure, but <laughs> double it, and I'll change my name forever. <laughs> I mean, I basically have accepted that my name is just Joe Cherries at this point. Well, I think this video's over. (laughs) It is. Peace out, Tribe Scout.